Um, I want to thank everybody for coming this afternoon. Uh, my name is Jan Greenberg. I'm a professor and the director of the School of Social Work. Um, if, uh, for uh, people who need CEUs, please see me after the talk, and I'll, I'll be sure to give you your, the CEUs. I'm thrilled that uh, Dr. Uh, Karina Walters um, accepted our invitation to speak at our, uh, our annual um, lecture on equity and social justice. Uh, Dr. Walters is internationally known for her groundbreaking studies associated, associated with health risk outcomes among American Indian individuals, families, and communities. Uh, this lecture is sponsored by Dr. Dorothy Pearson, Emeritus Professor of Social Work at Harwood University. Uh, before I turn it over to um, Professor Anna Haley Locke, who will introduce the speaker today, I, I wanted to say a few words about uh, Dr. Pearson. As her story makes me incredibly proud of being part of the School of Social Work, being part of this university, and being a Badger. Dorothy was born in Darburn, Mississippi, a small farming community in 1937. She, she was the youngest of nine children. She refers to her, herself as the surprise child. When she was eight, the family moved to Bogalusa, Louisiana, a small paper mill town. Uh, she, uh, Dorothy um, really excelled in high school, and her parents were incredibly supportive of her pursuing uh, a higher education. Um, she, she went on to receive a master's, uh, a bachelor's degree from Southern University in Baton Rouge in 1959. Um, throughout high school um, and college, um, she, she went to segregated schools. And she was about to enter, she was encouraged during her undergraduate, degree, her undergraduate program that she had the potential to go on for a master's degree, and she was encouraged to enter, and she had applied for and gained admissions to Atlanta University and Fisk University in the area. They were both segregated schools. But five days, I think, fortunate for us, uh, after she had graduated from Southern uh, University um, in Baton Rouge, her brother, who was living in Milwaukee, invited her for a little vacation. Um, and so she, uh, she uh, I think she took the train or the bus up to Milwaukee uh, to visit her brother. And um, I don't know if anybody knows what summer's like in, in, in Bogalusa, Louisiana, but it's hot. And she fell in love with the cool breezes off Lake Michigan. Also, as I said, uh, in the 1950s, the South was segregated. And she wanted to know what was on the other side. She had done really well in segregated schools, and she wanted to see if she could make it in an integrated educational system. So I wanted to show you a short clip of Dorothy, Dr. Pearson, talking about her decision uh, to try to cross the line. So at the, at the time, uh, the university had, uh, so Dorothy decided in that summer that she wanted to go to the school of social work. And at that time, the campus had two campuses, one in Milwaukee and one in Madison. And, the, both, and this was in the summertime. Application deadlines had far passed. They already selected their kind of incoming class, right? And so Dorothy was told, you know, you have to wait a year. And you don't tell Dorothy to wait if she has a goal in mind. So she decided she'd call up the director of the School of Social Work in Milwaukee. And she said, you know, I'd like to make an appointment. In those days, the director said yes. And she made an appointment. And, the, and she met with the director. And the director at that time was so impressed with her that he said, OK, we'll make an exception. We'll allow you into our program. Okay, so now she had admissions into the program but she was an out-of-state student, and she had absolutely no money to pay out-of-state tuition. It was just you know, out of the question. So she, at, in, those, in those days, they used to have uh, these scholarships for out-of-state tuitions, and they would waive the out-of-state tuition. And so she learned about it on her own resourcefulness. 
and then she called the graduate school and she was told that all of the out-of-state tuition scholarships had been granted for that year and there were no left and so she should wait a year and apply next year and you don't tell Dorothy to wait a year if she wants to start something and so she decided to do what most of us would not think of doing calling the dean of the graduate school and setting up an appointment in those days the dean actually said yes come by my office and let's talk so the dean met with her and you can he was so impressed with her and he thought here was somebody who was a go-getter and really highly motivated to attend this university so he said I'll make an exception and and he provided an out-of-state scholarship for her I don't know if he borrowed one but he did it right so two doors were open now she needed money she had a tuition but she didn't have any living expenses <laughs> back in those days uh, a lot of the agencies actually provided students with stipends a lot of the large social service agencies in those days um, and she was in the Milwaukee area so she decided to apply to one of the family service agencies in the Milwaukee area and she met again with the uh, director or the associate director of these family service agencies and all the stipends had been allocated for that year um, and, um, and he didn't have any stipends but he also saw in her, saw her in Dorothy somebody who was very special and what he did is he promised that if she could get through one semester that he would provide a stipend for her starting the second semester and Dorothy got through that first semester and then she got the stipend um, um, so Dorothy eventually completed her MSW degree um, I think it was in the ground probably 1962 and then she went on, she practiced for a few years and then she came back to the university to get her um, PhD from the school and I think it was 1973 after getting her during her, her during her time here she established uh, the uh, Association for African American Social Workers at that time um, after graduating from this year from this university uh, she took a position first at My Miami University then at Barry University and then she went on to Howard University in 1975 where she remained until uh, her retirement in 1999 um, there she established the first um, doctoral program in social work um, at Howard University she is also the, one of the founding members of the, 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 um, the national group for doctoral education. It's called the Group for the Advancement of Doctoral Education in Social Work. She has been the recipient of many, many, many awards. Uh, the National Association for Social Work bestowed in her its highest honor, the honor of a social work pioneer. Dr. Peterson is obviously a motivated, bright, energetic, and determined person. But in her, in a large part, or part of her success is due to the fact that doors were open here at this university at a time when doors were being tightly shut to African Americans. And she had the vision and the foresight to walk through these doors when opportunity rang. And I feel a tremendous pride in this university and the School of Social Work for opening the doors and I feel incredible admiration for Dr. Pearson that she had the wisdom to walk through those doors when opportunity um, came. I know through this lecture, and this lecture is obviously very important to the School of Social Work and it's very important to me on a very personal level because I know Dr. Pearson quite well now. She's established this lecture and she's also established a scholarship that she'll fund uh, to make sure that the similar opportunities are offered her are offered to the next generation of African American women social work scholars. Um, so I wanted to just share with you um, um, uh, a little about Dr. Pearson and who named, uh, whose lect lecture uh, this is named for. Uh, with that background, let me turn it over to uh, Professor Anna Haley Locke, the Associate Director of the School of Social Work, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Walters founded and directs the university-wide interdisciplinary Indigenous Wellness Research Institute, period. Her research focuses on historical, social, and cultural determinants of physical and mental health among American Indians, 
and Alaska Natives. She has published well over 50 journal articles and book chapters and received well over $10 million in funding from the National Institute of Health. Dr. Walters is known as a very dedicated and generous mentor and has mentored many American Indian and Alaska postdoctorate and graduate students who are making their own unique mark on social work scholarship. It's really a tremendous uh, contribution. Dr. Walters serves as a principal investigator on several groundbreaking studies associated with health risk outcomes among American Indian individuals, families, and communities funded by NIH. These include the Honor Project, a nationwide health survey that examines the impact of historical trauma, discrimination, and other stressors on the health and wellness of Native American, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and two-spirited men and women, and healthy hearts across generations. I first met Karina, Dr. Walters, when I was on the academic job market just out of graduate school, having applied to my other UW. I believe she headed the search committee at that point. At a meeting with the committee during my campus visit, she asked me, if you received a grant for $5 million, what would you do with it? I'm fairly sure my answer was uninspired, but it is not exaggerated to say that Karina inspires big and good and important thinking among her colleagues and students. Perhaps more importantly, she inspires work that upholds the advancement of social justice, a focus that was greatly fostered during my time on Washington's faculty in which I tried to advance in my own work on low-wage employment. We are so pleased that Karina is here today to talk about her current research on innovative and sustainable approaches to addressing historical trauma and health inequalities. Please join me in giving her a very warm winter in Madison. Hali to, sa chifa hatapushik and chanspo achebeche ahoyo, micha sa chifa Karina Walters, micha chata si ahoke, yokoke hochak nation, yokoke school of social work and Dr. Dorothy Pearson and and thank you to the Dr. Greenberg and Dr. Anna Haley Lock. I want to send my greetings and thank you. So extend my thank you to the indigenous territories and people of this land, the Ho Chunk Nation. I always first want to acknowledge the land that I'm on and the relatives and ancestors who are present here today. I want to also acknowledge our elders and leaders who are here as well and say thank you for being here and I hope to entertain you a little bit. I also wanted to um, acknowledge too that we stand uh, in the vicinity known to the Ho-Chunk uh, Nation is Dejo, yeah, meaning four lakes. And our indigenous, te our indigenous teachings teach us that water is our first medicine. The majority of our world is made up of it. Our bodies are made up of it. Uh, the water we drink today, when we think about it, simply rose to the heavens from the lips of our ancestors. Only to come back to us. Our water, our bodies are directly connected to the ancestors since time immemorial and belongs to the future generations as well. We also stand at the confluence of four lakes and on the lands where my ancestors and your ancestors had extensive trade networks, sharing knowledge, medicines, goods, maybe a husband or two along the way. Uh, I come from the Mound Builder uh, peoples as well, uh, the Choctaws, uh, Chickasaws, Cherokees, and Creeks, and all of, all of us also have a history of uh, mounds as well. So I wanted to uh, acknowledge my ancestors and our relationship because we probably traded with you. So there's a deep history and tradition of sharing and connecting, and I wanted to acknowledge and recognize that as we share once again today in these ancestral homelands. So these are some of my relatives uh, through time and uh, also acknowledging the Cherokee side of my family as well, um, because I'll be talking about historical trauma, and I will be sharing a little bit about some work we're doing around the Trail of Tears. So just as we have these deep ancestral connections with water and place, 
Our health, too, has deep connections to previous generations' wellness, oppression, and life circumstances. How we address our health and health inequities now will determine the wellness for our children's grandchildren and future generations. Our research imperative for building innovative health research to address health inequities must move beyond the current static disparity models that we have in place. We must recognize the complex connections from structural inequities to epigenetic memories. Our bodies, our minds, our spirits are inextricably linked across time, space, and place. We know that, in general, health follows wealth, right? On average, the higher the socioeconomic ladder you are, the lower your risk of cancer, diabetes, and uh, other kinds of things, unless you're American Indian or Alaska Native, unless you're from some communities of color. We know also that for highly educated populations of colors, these disparities persist despite attaining higher socioeconomic status and uh, better outcomes. Neonatologists James Collins and Richard David believe that the risk is not because of something innate to our biology, but because of the cumulative impact of racism, colonization, other kinds of factors, and traumatic stressors, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about historical trauma as one of those kinds of traumatic stressors that not only impact our collective wellness in the here and now, but could be carried through for generations. Jocelyn Elders notes that non-medical determinants of health include social and behavioral factors about 50% actually accounts for some of these issues. It's non-medical. Um, poverty, of course, is another major factor. These factors making a difference um, are living under conditions of extreme material deprivation, structural inequities, as children as well as adults, because we know the impact of place and that kind of deprivation on children can carry through. And it's a stress associated with such conditions and the adoption of health risk coping strategies that sometimes are functional in one generation, but not necessarily functional in the next generation, that can directly impact our wellness. But this is where the trenches are. This is where social work sits. This is where we, as social workers, can actually have a major impact. This is where we've been historically called to action. This is what we've been working on in collaboration with our communities and families. And as practitioners and now as health researchers, we actually have a mandate to really look at this more carefully in terms of health equity research. But before I talk about historical trauma, I gotta start with a story. So I set the stage a little bit about this background on um, health equity. And turning to historical trauma, I want you to think a little bit, and, and I'm doing this because one of the themes I'm going to talk a little bit about today is the impact of colonization and historical trauma on our communities is the disruption in our, uh, our relationship to our traditional knowledges and our indigenous knowledges and our ways of knowing and relational uh, ways of knowing. So I'm going to start with a story, and I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to circle back to that in terms of historical trauma. And this is a kind of a compilation story, so I've modernized it a bit. I want to acknowledge that for my elders who are in the audience who might recognize parts of this story. But this is the story of turtle, turkey, and rabbit. Okay, you with me? One day, long time ago, one day turkey was being turkey. Now you guys know turkey, right? Turkey, you know, she kind of walks about, struts about. She doesn't pay attention to where she walks. Turkey just has the kind of privilege where she doesn't have to look where she walks. So she's walking along, walking along, not paying attention to anything, just, you know, doing her own thing. And all of a sudden, she walks and crunch. Ah, she steps on turtle. She jumps back and turtle goes, turkey, what are you doing? You just crushed my shell. You stepped on me. You weren't paying attention to where you're walking. Turkey looked at turtle and said, well, you're in my way. What are you doing just sitting out in the path? And, and Turtle's like, what kind of response is that? You stepped on me, you weren't paying attention to where you're walking and you crushed my shell, now what am I going to do? I have no shell. And for a moment, Turkey felt something. And Turkey thought, oh yeah, it's kind of pitiful. Look at Turtle's shell, it's all thousands of pieces on the ground. So she turned to Turtle and she said, all right, Turtle, I'm really sorry. Yeah, I, I should have been paying attention and I'm sorry I stepped on your shell. What can I do to help you? What can I do to help put that shell back together? Ah, just then, ant people were watching this conversation and ant people were so impressed that turtle and turkey were actually talking, they came over and they said, well, what can we do to help you two? 
this is really good. And they go, I know what we could do. Let's go talk to spider people. So all the ant people went over and they went to spider people and they said, spider people, can you help us? We're trying to put turkey, you know, turkey, you know, and turtle shell back together and, and turkey's gonna help out. And so spider people said, well, here's my web. Here, you can take it. So the ant people brought that, um, the web material together and together they wove together that turtle shell all back together. So now you know why turtle shells have all those cracks in them, right? All right, now you know. So turkey being turkey, look for that turtle shell now that's all back together, you know, pretty and everything. And, and turkey goes, hey, I always wondered what it would be like to be a turtle. Can I try that on? <laughs> Turtle's like, I cannot believe you want to try to think you can be like me and walk in my shell. Well, all right, go ahead, turtle. Turkey, go ahead, put that turtle shell on if you want to see what that's like. So, you know, Turkey, oh, she gets herself all squished into this shell. And she's on the ground sitting there going, wow, this is pretty cozy in here. I don't know how turtle does it. Just then, rabbit comes walking up. Now, you all know rabbit, right? Rabbit's, uh, you know, he's always, he's a little bit of a mischief maker. He walks up and he usually likes to challenge turtle to a race because he knows he can win. So once again, he sees turtle shell just sitting there on the side of the road. Of course, we know turkey's in there. And so he walks right up to that turtle shell and he goes, turtle, I challenge you to a race. Ha. And so turkey hears rabbit's request and goes, oh, I have an opportunity to make good here with turtle. So turkey answers, okay. So turtle said, what's your conditions? Rabbit says, okay, here's the deal. The first one to go all the way around the lake, right back to the spot, wins. And I'll, I'll say, on your mark, get set, go. And then we go. And so then Turtle says, OK. He's like, wow, that's the strangest sounding turtle. All right, all right. He's like, on your mark. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> he's like, giant legs come out of that shell. Get set. <laughs> <laughs> By now, a rabbit's going, what's going on? Go. Turkey comes back around, goes around that lake so fast, rabbit couldn't even move. He was so shocked. And of course, turkey won it for turtle that day, and rabbit walked away with his head hanging low. And that's why rabbit will never challenge turtle to a race again. Okay. How is that connected to historical trauma? It is. Okay, so when we think about it, we think about recovering from historical trauma. What can you? What are a couple of few lessons that we take away from that? And you shout it out if you feel like it. Collective action. For us to have transformative change, we have to have a couple of key elements. We have to have recognition of power and privilege. Turkey was totally oblivious; didn't have to recognize it, right? And and not being aware can actually damage and hurt people, right? He, she stepped on his shell. Forgiveness and compassion and the role of that in this process of healing from historical trauma and intergenerational trauma. We have to have forgiveness and compassion. Um, Turtle was able to forgive, but there was another piece that was important, the collective action. Uh, the community came by and worked together for the healing to happen. But the key part is there was an opportunity for restitution and repair. It's not enough to say you're sorry. You have to actually do something to resolve and to provide repair. And Turkey had a chance to do that by running the race for turtle. So we tell stories like this because indigenous knowledges give us our protocols quite often for how we are to conduct ourselves in the world. And it also provides an opportunity for a look at, uh, to look at these kinds of stories as ways to structure our understanding of, of returning to health. And what does health look like? How can we build our health um, paradigms and protocols on some of these knowledges? I just want to highlight a couple of key things, though, that makes it complicated in doing research, uh, especially behavioral science research and health disparities research, uh, because uh, people don't always understand these points of view. But the points of view I want to kind of highlight have to do with, I think, something that's really critical uh, that, that is about building um, healing and wellness back into our communities. Um, first, I acknowledged earlier that in, uh, colonization has disrupted our ability to uh, or disrupted our relationships. Relationships to each other, relationships to land, if we were forci forcibly relocated, 
relationships to our bodies, relationships sometimes even to our minds. Uh, so this relational approach is an indigenous point of view. You hear it in, across all of our languages. We have different words for basically acknowledging we are all related. We are all, all related. This relational r approach in worldview extends not to um, just the here and now. It extends across time and place, right? So in this moment, I am my grandmother's granddaughter. In this moment, I am my granddaughter's grandmother. In this moment, I'm all of these things. If I take an action for health and health care for myself in this moment, in the here and now, I'm not just affecting myself, I'm affecting future generations, as well as providing an opportunity to heal past generations, because I carry all of that in this moment. That's a very different approach to health research, right, than what you typically see. But that's, that's not atypical for a lot of our own communities. That involves a lot of spatial, or, uh, spatial and cognitive flexibility. Um, so I'm just going to highlight some of those things as I, I talk a little bit about um, how we created some of the work we're doing today methodologically. One of the major points of our work is looking at how do traumatic stressors, now that's the question, how do these traumatic stressors over time and over generations literally get taken up in our bodies? How do, how do they become embodied um, in our bodies as well as our risk behaviors? Um, I'm going to be drawing from an indigenous stress coping model. I'm not going to talk too much about it now, but I will be talking about some of these historically traumatic events. But the piece that I'm kind of uh, highlighting also there is looking at everyday chronic discrimination, which is known as discriminatory or microaggression events. I won't have time to talk a lot about that tonight, but I wanted to highlight that as another chronic stressor that interacts with this intergenerational trauma. But more importantly, just because we've uh, been affected by historically traumatic events that have disproportionately impacted our community doesn't mean we all have poor outcomes. Actually, the majority of us are doing pretty well, despite these bad events. So what, what I am curious about in terms of building um, prevention and interventions in our communities is thinking about, well, what protects us? What are the protective factors that buffer the impact of these kinds of traumatic events and everyday discrimination on our wellness? So things like family, identity, culture, traditions, um, sense of connectedness, sense of belongingness, all of these can be protective factors that buffer the impact, not only on our physical body, but on our, our mind, body, spirit, the whole nine yards. So wellness is a, a very big perspective. I also want to acknowledge that a lot of our current research, what makes it challenging to do some of this work is um, most of our measurements are about the absence of disease, not the presence of wellness. So a lot of the measures are saying, we want to reduce depression. We want to reduce uh, you know, problems with diabetes. We want to reduce risk behaviors. But what we don't spend a lot of time on is trying to develop measures and models that say, well, what are we trying to produce, not reduce? What do we want to produce for the wellness of our communities? What does that really look like? So, so look, going back to this embodiment thing, um, Nancy Krieger is a, a public health scholar. I draw heavily from her work. Uh, she does some, really uh, has written a lot about this. She says bodies tell histories and stories, just as bones illuminate important information about the everyday lives of our ancestors. So our contemporary bodies literally express stories about our lived experiences, whether we're conscious of it or not. Our bodies tell a story. Um, and so the, studying the embodiment of historical trauma distress and corresponding health consequences actually allows us to determine the forces driving intergenerational patterns of disease. So that's an important piece. Now, that's not without controversy, and I want to acknowledge that. Not everybody uh, in our communities even think this is a concept that's worthy of study. Um, however, that's being a little bit challenged because now, even at the cellular level, uh, epigen uh, epigenomic scientists are actually saying, well, wait a minute, there's actually some interesting data that's amassing that the cellular material um, can actually be passed over generations, uh, a mark on that material, that could be passed over generations that shows that there's some kind of stress that reaction that could be passed on. And not surprisingly, that's correlated with what kinds of diseases that you see disproportionately in our communities. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension. So embodiment basically reminds us that we can't exclude social, historical, accumulative experiences and impact on wellness. Biological and psychological expressions of historical trauma may 
in part, produce health disparities in a wide spectrum. Now, I want to just one, pick one, make one uh, caveat about health disparities. The reason why I, used, I try to use health equity more than health disparities is, is because health equity not only implies the social justice aspects of dealing with health uh, problems and disparities, but quite often our standards are, I, I think, frankly, too low if we're trying to say we're reducing health disparities because America in general is unhealthy, right? So reducing disparities doesn't necessarily make us all well. So we've got a, a, a global as well as a national crisis at hand here. I'm drawing uh, down from data from the Honor Project. I'm gonna share a little bit with you. It's a six uh, site funded national study from the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, we, uh, if you wanna know how we collected data to find gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, two-spirit American Indians, Alaska Natives uh, in urban settings. Uh, we started with seeds and we did respondent driven sampling and we randomly sampled from within people's networks to do this. Um, just to give you a quick visualization, there's six people in Seattle we started with, and then they um, gave us uh, names of people within their network, and we randomly, randomly sampled them, and uh, we're able to establish the network structures. Anyone wants to ask questions about that later, I'll be happy to talk about it. So setting the context, when I talked about historical trauma, what do I mean? Am I talking too fast? I've had lots of coffee. Are you guys okay? Okay. All right, just checking. Historical trauma is different than intergenerational trauma. It's related, but it's different. Historical trauma is conceptualized as an event that is targeting a particular population with the intention of ethnocide or genocide. It's the intention to destroy culture or life ways. It's not an oops moment. It's not a hurricane that's blown through. It's human design and human response. The event individually can, it, it, it will, could be profoundly traumatic, but it's a collective experience. A whole collective is targeted. Um, we talk about how the trauma could be transmitted over generations. Um, and family members who've not even directly experienced the trauma can carry some of the trauma stress with them. And we were talking about that as well. <coughs> what makes it hard in research to kind of disentangle some of this is historical trauma is used in a lot of different ways in the literature. People use it as a reference point for saying, you know, there's these historically traumatic events as an ideological or causal agent. There's these events that cause these bad out health outcomes. Other people talk about it as a type of trauma response. They call it historical trauma response, which means that there's specific uh, atypical grief reactions that might be very specific to that kind of uh, trauma. And then other people talk about historical trauma. What they mean is they're talking about there's a mechanism or a pathway by which this trauma is transmitted over generations. And then other people talk about historical trauma-related stressors, or, or, or like historical trauma loss, for example, Les Whitbeck's work would fall in that, that area. So that's been a little bit complicating um, the ability to theorize well historical trauma in Indian country. Um, I'm gonna skip that. So we went out to um, groups, uh, this is years ago, uh, not in the Honor Project, in an earlier study called the Turtle Island Native Wellness Project. We actually went out to the groups and said, because uh, the community said, historical trauma matters to us. We want to try to have a way of measuring it and looking at it. So we ran a series of focus groups. And of course, the themes that came up when we said, well, what is historical trauma? What does that look like? Uh, the first theme that hit was genocide, that there's these genocidal events that targeted our particular communities. And that included things like relocation, allotments, um, reservations, land allotment process. Um, it included environmental trauma. So I think this is an important piece that gets missed in historical trauma work. Uh, these are buffalo skulls. Uh, General Sheridan said the best way to kill, quote, the Sioux, or the, the Lakota and Dakota Nakota peoples was to uh, kill the buffalo. And a, a lot of people think that that's about killing the life way of the people, but it's, it's deeper than that. Because what they were doing was disrupting a people's ability to fulfill their original instructions. That's a fundamental hallmark of historical trauma and colonization. It's to fundamentally disrupt a people's ability to fulfill their original instructions. Okay. The boarding school period, are you all familiar, pretty familiar with this? So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on that, um, but uh, clearly taking children and placing them into boarding schools, um, uh, and if you went against that, you could be incarcerated or your family uh, could have food rations withheld and th uh, that kind of thing. It was pretty bad. Uh, 1880s, three events happened in the 1880s that, that mark um, important piece in uh, Native history. And 1880 is not that long ago, right? 
So one of the major things is uh, we became almost human enough, um, and at that point we could be educatable, so hence these boarding schools. We also could become uh, declared mentally ill. Uh, the first American Indian Insane Asylum came about during that period as well. So that's an important piece. Um, this is Tom Torino when he arrived. Uh, he's a young Navajo man when he arrived at Carlisle Indian School, one of the first major ones set up. And this is him three years later. So the, the point of these schools was to, quote, kill the Indian to save the man and um, to assimilate, but that's too nice of a word. It was to literally um, commit ethnocide in terms of culture and life ways for our, our people. So the impact of historical trauma, uh, the colonial impact, several factors there. A disruption in our ability to fulfill our original instructions. A disruption, it causes disruption in our relational ways of being, right? When you're stripped from your families, your, your relationships to not only your family, but also your culture, your language, those kinds of relational ways of being. Disruption in our spatial obligations and relationships. What are our obligations to our ancestors and our future generations? That gets disrupted. Uh, could cause a breakdown in physical, mental, spiritual, land-based boundaries. And part of the key thing about colonization is it, tries, it creates a system of dependency. It requires, by definition, a dependent dependency on the host state. The, nation, the, the dependency must be part of that equation as part of colonization. Um, so what do we do to undo that? So there's three areas that we've been working on um, in terms of decolonizing, and that includes building all of our interventions and even our research methods around our original instructions. Our original instructions are our foundation for our teachings and restoring our health and wellness. So we start our interventions from the original instructions. The second piece is relational restoration. How do we restore our relationships and our relational ways of being and thinking to ourselves, our bodies, our roles, our responsibilities, each other? And then narrative transformation. How did we learn this? Where did we learn this? How we think and talk about ourselves really matters. So thinking across those lines. And I'll give you a brief example. Um, when I was asked to come and consult uh, with the Northwest community around a, a diabetes intervention, uh, I was called in because the children had uh, type 2 diabetes, were, were very young, and were very, very overweight and obese. And um, they asked me to come in to help, and I didn't know this community very well, and I went into archival uh, library and photos and looked at what did this community look like, what's their history, and they were very uh, lean and, and, and uh, incredible uh, fishing and hunting culture. So I went, and um, you know, I was greeted by a group of all grandmas, all the grandmas in the community. You know, and uh, that's intimidating right there. You got 15 grandmas sitting in there, elders. And I walked in, and the first thing is that she says to me, she said, okay, don't you be sending any of those skinny white ladies in to talk to us. <laughs> they don't have our bodies. Our bodies are different than those white people's bodies, and don't be sending any of those people to talk to us, because our babies have always been big, and plump, and that's how we are, and that's how, you know, that we're, we're, that's how we have always been. We have chunky babies, it's healthy, it's good. So I'm like, wow, this is totally in direct conflict with what they've just asked me to deal with, right? But I'm not gonna say anything. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, well, I looked at those pictures, I didn't see any chunky, okay. So I thought, well, there's something about this that's very important that's being communicated to me here. A, telling me, hey, you, uh, this m little mixed blood outsider coming in here, don't be telling me how to be. I had to honor that and respect that. But the other thing it was telling me is that they deeply love their children and they will do anything to protect their children. But there's a narrative there that really big babies is healthy and that's the narrative that they have. And I'm wondering where that narrative came from or where did it start? So I, I started, whenever you do historical trauma work in our communities, we never start with the trauma. We start with love, we start with the goodness. We start with goodness. So I asked her, I said, well, when, uh, can you tell me, because I'm an outsider, tell me what's culturally appropriate to share with me about um, what were your original instructions for food and, and, and eating and hunting and gathering and anything else that involved physical activity. She's like, that's a strange question. That's, no one's asked us that. Who? Okay. And they started talking with each other, and they said, oh, remember when you see that butterfly? We know to go get these berries. And then they said, well, we didn't have an opportunity to pass that on to some of our kids yet. That gave me the opening, because the next thing you do is we ask, when did that get disrupted? 
when did that get disrupted, your ability to pass on some of these original instructions that you're t sharing with us today? When, when did, what, what big event happened here? And they said, oh, it was when we got put on this reservation. Huge problem, huge problem. I said, well, what happened? And they said, well, when we first got put on this reservation, we had a great starvation. We starved. They gave us bags of flour. We had no idea what it was. We had no idea. They gave us foreign food. We didn't want to eat it. And then they didn't give us enough. We ran out of supplies. We starved. So people died. And I said, well, what did you do to protect the children? What did your ancestors do to protect the babies? Because I brought it back to the babies again. And they said, oh, oh, we uh, made sure the babies always ate. You know, we made sure they had enough. The big babies survived. Aha. The light bulb went off. Because it's not about, and we literally all had a collective aha moment, that that was an important survival strategy that in that generation worked. So I said, is that survival strategy working now? And they're like, no. <laughs> and then we could begin our conversation. So I said, now you have the opportunity to now change the behaviors in a way that will now protect the next future generations too. So what are you going to do? What, what kind of vow are you going to make to your children? What an exciting moment to be in this moment together to figure this out. So that's an example of how we put it together in the research realm. Um, preliminary findings, just to kind of say, so I'm not just talking out, you know, just for fun and just telling you my theory. You know, one of the uh, critiques of historical trauma research is, well, maybe historical trauma really doesn't matter. What really matters is contemporary violence that people are currently experiencing. Maybe that trumps historical trauma uh, impact that happened a couple generations ago. And I think that's a really valid empirical question. And I think it's a red herring, though, to say it has to be either or. I mean, the question really is, how do these things potentially interact? How do these both may produce negative outcomes? And so what we did is we controlled for, statistically, we controlled for their own military combat exposure, their own history of childhood trauma and adult trauma, their own history of sexual assault, we even in control for their own history of lifetime historically traumatic event exposure, taking all that out of the equation, basically, so that we could see what kind of events in previous generations could potentially impact present generation health and mental health. And what we found, we were looking at mental health here, was that, sure enough, after controlling for that, historically traumatic events in previous generations did have an impact on PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and depressive symptoms. But what was interesting is it fell out a certain way so that what we're thinking is that uh, direct attacks on community or family or place led to PTSD, but uh, disruptions in family, community, or place led to more chronic symptoms of depression. So we're, the type of historical trauma event actually matters in terms of the kind of potential impact. We saw the chronicity of events over generations. So did your grandparents and great-grandparents have a chronic series of historically traumatic events? So chronicity also impacted current alcohol use and, and, and drinking behaviors. And then also it was related to um, physical pain. So how often you thought about historical trauma loss was related to 22% of the variance and self-reported pain was attributed to historical trauma. So. So we have some data to show this. Now here's the good news. The good news, I know you guys are getting really bummed out right now. We're getting really sad, and, and, but here's the good news. Remember I talked about the stress coping and what are those cultural protective factors? What we found was that identity matters. So um, when we looked at chronic everyday discrimination and microaggression distress, what we found is that people who um, had a positive identity as a native person, that that actually buffered the impact of that kind of distress on self-reported pain and self-reported health. However, if people didn't have a positive identity, it was a conduit to poor self-reported health and poor self-reports around pain. So after doing all of this historical trauma research, I had the great opportunity with, to work finally with For My Own Tribe um, a number of years ago, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I was uh, called out and I met with uh, Choctaw Nation Health Services Director and um, and Mickey sat me down and he said, can you help us with diabetes and obesity prevention? And I'm like, I, maybe, I think so. And I toured the clinics and everything. And uh, we have the state of the art. We have some beautiful clinics, um, both health fitness centers. I mean, I want to go work out there. Who needs Gold's Gym? I mean, we have great fitness centers. Um, we have state of the art diabetes centers. We have state of, they were changing the menus at the tribal level. They're putting in walking paths so you don't have to worry about dogs chasing you down the street all the time, you know, that kind of stuff. 
safe places to walk. So incredible stuff is going on in my tribe. It's good. Um, but the train is going too fast for those interventions to catch up. So in the Western model, everything is working. Um, so he said, I'm really worried because what we're projecting is by 2050, uh, one out of three of our kids are going to have type 2 diabetes. One out of three. Over 70% of our population right now is obese or overweight. We're in a generation where our parents will outlive our grandchildren and our children. I'm like, wow, that, that, was, that really hit home when I heard that. And then he said, can you help us? And I thought, no, <laughs> that's way overwhelming. And um, one of the things I thought about, I said, let me go pray about it. Now, I'll be honest, as a researcher, that's why I said, I, said, I need to go pray about this because this is going to involve something else, not just what I know from the Western tools that we have. And what I, I walked away and I really gave it some uh, thought and I realized that our ancestors did not walk that trail of tears for us to be dying like this. That they had a, held a vision for us, a vision of love and life that they carried for us as they walked on that trail. Um, and to give you a little bit of a background on that, so the Oklahoma Choctaws, we descend from the ancestors who survived the Trail of Tears. You all know about the Trail of Tears, remember that in history books? The Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek um, led to our, our removal, and that treaty stipulated that Choctaws could remain in Mississippi if they relinquished their sovereignty as a people. So we descend from those folks who did not do that. Okay, so those who survived the trail, it was a major arduous journey, and they had a vision for us when they walked that trail because they knew that they were going to have hardship when they went on that trail and they knew they were doing it to maintain sovereignty so they were holding something for us that we they made a vow to us and we have a responsibility to that so Choctaw Nation was looking for working with Choctaw health leaders to come up with some of these innovative solutions and so what I did was I met with Sharon Fleming our chief sister um, who's uh, since passed uh, she and I talked, and, and she also had a vision for rewalking the Trail of Tears. And so we put our heads together and we thought, well, wait a minute, let's rewalk that trail, not to get back into the historical trauma, not as a memorial walk, not as a getting into the drama of the trauma. We don't want that. But what we want to do is walk in the footsteps of our ancestors to get reconnected to the vision that they held for us so that we can remake a vow to that vision in a renewed way for our future generations and build our Choctaw health promotion model based on that. And so that sounds a little bit wild and we went back and we proposed that and the tribe said, okay. <laughs> and they said, go do it, <laughs> which really freaked me out, but okay. Um, to give you an idea, so what we did is we had to go and look at archival records and all of this uh, background information. I looked at military records, I had to look at old uh, maps to try to find the trails. The Cherokee Trail is pretty well mapped. Ours overlaps some of it, but a lot of it doesn't overlap. Uh, and one of the things that we started unearthing was what, would, what were, was the vision that people held for us uh, as we went on the trail. And here's just an example. Chief Harkins wrote in 1831 to his farewell letter to the American people, um, uh, one of the Choctaw chiefs. He said, we as Choctaws rather choose to suffer and be free than live under the degrading influence of laws which our voice could not be heard in their formation. I could cheerfully hope that those Choctaws of another age and generation may not feel the effects of those oppressive measures that have been so illiberally dealt out to us, and that peace and happiness may be their reward. Amid the gloom and horrors of the present separation, we are cheered with the hope that ere long we shall reach our destined land, and that nothing short of the basest act of treachery will ever be able to wrest it from us, and that we, and that we may live free. Although our ancestors won freedom on the field of danger and glory, our ancestors owned it as their birthright, and we have had to purchase it from you as slaves by their freedom. Okay? So uh, we started shifting our focus and really started talking about this. And so the tribe, some of the elders uh, got excited, the health leaders got excited about this. They said, great, we walk the trail and you can do substance abuse prevention with youth, and you can do HIV prevention on the trail, and you could do, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 time out. That's not what we want to do. What we want to do is say, instead of doing substance abuse prevention, we want to rewalk that trail and ask, that, uh, ask the question, what are our original teachings around medicines and how we're supposed to relate to medicines? What, instead of suicide prevention, what are our original teachings for life and living? Instead of psychopathology prevention, what are our original teachings about maintaining wellness and balance? And when we get out of balance, how do we correct that? 
that's what we were to meditate and focus on as we walked on the trail. So really looking at our cultural values for our change in health promotion. And the other piece that came out of this was we're not building for services. We wanted to create a project that wasn't about building further services because what we realized is we do a great job of telling people what not to do. Don't eat too much, don't drink, don't smoke, da 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 da. And we do a great job of telling people what to do, walk a little, eat smaller proportion size, but that's not motivating. What's motivating is the piece that's missing, which is reminding us why we exist as Choctaws. Why are we here? Why are we here? Why do we live as Choctaws? And then we can start to, to, to build it out that way. So we're about trying to build a project that has sustainability at the community level that's not tied to actual services. Services are important, but that's not where we need to find our cultural processes. That's where culture is engaged but that's not where we find our solutions for sustainable change at the community level. So the first step was naming the project and we, named, and we went to the elders and we talked to elders and uh, it was really neat because what came out was a name that's not com a word that's not commonly used, Yapali. Uh, we had a little pushback from our language department because it was an unfamiliar old term. And they're like, well, that's not, a, it, you know, that's not really in our language anymore. It's like really old. And we're like, that's the point. <laughs> we like that. <laughs> So they went with it. It means to walk softly and slowly, like with reverence. And when we asked our elders to interpret it, um, and we talked to first primary language speakers around this, which is very different than going to your language department, which most research projects ask us to do. We did both, and it was brilliant how you get really very different interpretations of things. Um, but we, the way when the elders talked about it is, it's about blessing the sacred grounds of our ancestors' sacrifice to create a better, healthier life for our children and our children's children, reclaiming our history, our healthy ways as a people, and our medicine in a spiritual way as well as in all ways. Um, and so what are the lessons that we need to learn from retracing the footsteps, actually walking the trail? And we were very specific. We want to walk the actual trail. We don't want the highways that they tell us on with our road signs that says, oh, that's approximately the trail right there. Um, no, we wanted to find it. Um, and uh, so uh, we, our, our mandate was to understand the ancestral vision and intentions for our health, translate these visions into health promotion practices for Choctaw Nation and future generations, transforming our relationships to health or ourself and bringing in our original instructions, so moving from a disease model to one of a wellness model, um, and transforming our relationship to the trauma itself, so we're not caught up into the trauma cycle, but really moving forward and creating innovations based on our core values. So what we did is a very small group of us started off. It was really interesting. It ended up being, we asked for volunteers, um, very small group, um, uh, and it was primarily behavioral health uh, leaders who stepped forward um, and women who stepped up and said, I'm going to do this. Can I bring my kids on the walk as well? And we said, okay. Um, they had to be over the age of 12 because of safety issues. The elders told us we had to go do it in June. Anyone from Oklahoma? Arkansas? All right, we had to walk in June, okay? That's all I'm saying. Um, Choctaw IRB required us to have things on our IRB, such as, you know, uh, chiggers, uh, being <laughs> bit by chiggers, <laughs> mosquitoes, fire ants, uh, water moccasins, and <laughs> having a safety plan for those kinds of things. We needed it, back up actually. Um, we did qualitative data gathering. We actually interviewed people before they went on the walk with their expectations of the walk. We included people who were from the community at Choctaw. We also included people who are from the diaspora, who are Choctaw relations who never were, grew up back home, who wanted to come back to so get different points of view on what, what they were experiencing. Um, we did GIS and blogging. We actually blogged the trail so that people who were back home could follow and Choctaw Nation could follow along, even though people physically couldn't walk. Um, we held focus groups on the trail. We'll never do that again. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, we did journaling. Didn't work. And we also did digital storytelling. At the end of the project, we had people create their stories. And then those stories were then used to not only keep for their family, but also to share and disseminate the experience back out to the communities, which we did with a number of communities so far. We were given pedometers, journals, cameras, the whole nine, yard, uh, nine yards. Um, we developed a curriculum that we followed each day about thinking and meditating around certain of the, these things. That's an example of the curriculum we have up there. Different words, we incorporated words, and the history of the trail. So we actually followed different clans through the trail as we camped. So what we did was we would 
We started on the border of uh, Mississippi, Arkansas, right around there, because uh, it was as if we had just crossed over on the ferries um, uh, uh, onto land, and we started at Arkansas Post, and we camped every night. We broke camp, we made camp every night, no hotels, nah. -uh. We had to live out, in the, uh, out, out there. Uh, the trail, by the way, quite often goes on wildlife refuges that doesn't see very many humans, so we did feed the mosquito population. We prayed about trying to figure out what the purpose of chiggers were. Um, <laughs> we learned that word in Choctaw, and we realized that they actually prey on mosquitoes, so they have a purpose. <laughs> anyway, so we actually would camp in, we found the clan camping spots where a lot of the different uh, groups that were trekking would meet up and camp at. And that's where we camp. So what we do is we try to walk the 8 to 10 miles, sometimes 15 miles a day, that match the same amount of miles our ancestors walked on the intact portions of the trail. Um, and then at night we would gather and meet and talk and basically fall asleep and be exhausted. Um, and, and that's basically what we did. And we would drive the segments of the trail to get to the next camp uh, after, after we... So basically we covered over... Uh, 200 miles in 10 days um, uh, during that period. So we had 13 Choctaw walkers, five native allies. We wanted uh, other native tribes to be present to witness and provide feedback. We actually had one indigenous ally from a uh, tribe, the Truku tribe in Taiwan, who was a doctoral student who came to document and think about what she's seeing is a decolonizing methodologies from her point, point of view. Uh, we had four parent youth pairs. Um, three were raised outside of Choctaw Nation, two urban, one rural. Uh, ten were Choctaw women, and you know, it's funny, it, we ended up with all women, that wasn't purposeful. Um, the elders at one point said that's how it should be, the women should start, because and this is what happened, stories started emerging. So elders said, traditionally, Choctaw women were responsible for restoring the balance to uh, when there was a great disturbance that happened in the community, the women were responsible for those ceremonies to bring that balance back together. Um, and so they said, not that we were doing that, but just saying that this makes sense to us that women are the first to go. Men went with us as well, but um, it was the Choctaw women that were the participants. We, so we walked across Arkansas. I have to tell you, it's very swampy, very swampy. I had no idea how swampy Arkansas was. Um, okay, so the, here's the route, basically. You can see across Arkansas. That's one of the routes that we, we went the, we did a, um, a southern and we went up into a northern route a little bit and then we came back down. I told you a little bit about the importance of words and we had certain principles that we said we would agree to culturally to conduct ourselves while on this, this trip. And one was to listen, haklo. So uh, the language department said the word is haklo that you want to use and they gave us this interpretation of what it means. Then we went to a first language speaker elder and we said, what does haklo mean? And she said, oh, well, that means what is said may be very important to your life. These are her words. Um, listen, Haklo is to remember that the medicine given to us is still out there. We have just forgotten to listen for it. It is to be at peace with oneself, to be quiet and soft in spirit, to stop trying to speak out for others, to hear and communicate, to understand. It is about sharing from the spirit and taking the time to honor another human being. That's Haklo. So that's the, the level of deep uh, thinking we were doing around this. Uh, it, this was a unique project. We were not only participants, we were researchers, but we were also participants. So I also was a participant and a researcher. They, we trained the commu our, our community partners, interviewed us, and we interviewed them. That's different. Um, we did ceremony together. Um, yeah. And you know, what was really came out of this was the impact other communities had in knowing we were doing this. So the other thing is we had a lot of communities in, uh, uh, give great meaning to this walk for them, themselves as well, even though they weren't from uh, Choctaw. We did qualitative uh, in, initial analysis. Um, that's my doctoral student's work on the floor. And just to give you a couple ideas of the themes that are starting to emerge from it, uh, the importance of belonging, identity, pride, of course. Um, some of the themes around transforming the trauma, uh, really focusing on the hope and resilience and love. What we realize this isn't about historical trauma, it's about love. And it's a really different framework when you get to that love place. Uh, the importance of laughter as medicine. We really discovered Choctaws were pretty irreverent sometimes. Uh, our native allies who were with us were horrified when we got to this one part of this area where the dirt goes way deep in the ground where thousands of people marched and walked and we were laughing and giggling and they thought we've lost our minds. We've been in the sun a little too long. But what it was is we realized our relatives had joy in that place. 
because there were trees and they had relief. So we got connected to the joy as well, and that was important. Uh, it helped us return the suffering to the sacred as opposed to being caught up in the trauma. One of our young people had a very, she was on the third day, we had our focus group, and this is what she said. She says, I get it, I heal others when I keep or make myself healthy. If I'm just a healthy teenager, then the next generation is going to be healthy. I'm like, done, done, we're done. Can we go home now? <laughs> and then we had a lot about relational healing and reconnecting to uh, tribe, to land, to place, to family, to naming. Some uh, songs came for some women, uh, uh, nicknames emerged. Um, something came up, uh, Dr. Johnson Jennings is, uh, Michelle Johnson Jennings is the other researcher involved in this. She's Choctaw up in uh, University of Minnesota. And she and I were having a conversation. Now this would never have happened had we not been in this project together. We were joking, just joking around one night about uh, the Shalombush and the Shalup. Uh, these are like, uh, the, your Shalombush is like your, uh, your energy, that excitable part of you, that, that spirit of you that's, you know, can get really excited and could jump out, you know, could jump out of you. And that's why you have to make sure you call it back so you don't leave it somewhere because it gets very excitable. Uh, your shirlip is like that spirit, that part of you that uh, keeps you fed, keeps you clothed, kind of keeps you going. It's that shell keeps you going. And we have stories about uh, these two, you know, around death and passing and different things. Um, so we were joking about that, like when you're on a play yard and you got too excited, did your mom go, Krita, you know, and I'd be standing right there, I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, yelling my name out there because <laughs> she had to, you know, make sure we get called home. So we were joking about those kind of stories and we had an aha moment. We were both clinicians, we were both therapists in, in communities for years, and then all of a sudden we both thought, oh, that's a chalk top. We knew how to deal with PTSD. That's it. Your shalumbush, when it leaves, that's a disassociation. You walk around like a shell. Your shilip is your shell. And um, we talked about how your shalumbush actually holds memory of the place where it's gone to, and you have to call it back. That's the flashbacks. So we started thinking, how can we start thinking about a Choctaw-specific uh, healing ceremony around, around that in modern times of PTSD? So here's some uh, highlights from the trail. Uh, yes, Swampy. So that's camping out. That's Village Creek State Park. You can see how deep the trail is in parts where people marched. Cherokees and others went on that part. Yeah, there we are. That was hot. See, there's parts of it. There's no trees. Uh, we gathered medicines along the way. Incredible stories emerged. Here's some of the families that went. Uh, we encountered things. Yeah, those were flags that were hung out in one area. Uh, our feet <laughs> were hurting. Laughter is medicine was one of the things that came out. Making connections. We had a chance to find out a lot of stories and traditional stories. We heard stories uh, about um, old stories coming out from people's families that hadn't been shared before. Uh, here's some of the parent-child-youth pairs. They said it was incredible to be together and not have to be on the cell phone all day long. It wasn't allowed. The only time we were allowed cell phones was uh, the, the leader, whoever was caring, to make sure we can communicate when we were dropped off at our walk spot, um, but at night to blog and make sure let your family know you're okay, but during the day no, no, no cell phones. Um, some, uh, so some of the things that emerged from that first walk, um, we developed seven Choctaw principles that we wanted to ensure that we continued to operate by. We developed a, a, a curriculum for the next round for developing uh, something. And one of the things that really came out of that curriculum was um, we wanted a curriculum that addressed Choctaw values based on traditional stories for social roles and codes of conduct related to health. And uh, we realized we had a very complex social and ceremonial life, um, and we wanted to tap into that. And so we developed a curriculum that draws from historical Choctaw clan systems. And you know, a lot of people say that we didn't have like the uh, totemic clans, animal-based clans, and things like that, because later writers and anthropologists, and I'm telling you, we looked in records from the 1700s kind of stuff. Um, there's some evidence that we did, actually. Um, but we looked also to our Chickasaw relatives and our Muscogee relatives and others to see where we might have overlap and not. So what we did is we looked at each of these traditional clans, wolf, panther, holly leaf, deer, raccoon, white crane, and wind, uh, starting with those 
um, as well as the four pillars of wellness, and I'll show you that in a minute, uh, having to do with the balance of mind, body, spirit. Um, and then what we did is we started to create a curriculum um, saying that we want to have a group of women, so the, this is the, the mandate was to work with women, so what we're going to do is take a group of 150 women, so 30 women over five years um, from each of the tribal districts who are willing to step forward to be health leaders in their community, not paid health leaders, just are willing to make that vow and commitment to the people and to themselves, first working on themselves around obesity prevention and substance abuse prevention. Um, and when we work on themselves through this curriculum, we're also going to be uh, working on looking at training for um, uh, becoming community organizers as well, because you, we have to have that as well uh, for community health leaders. So basically, we start with like Neshoba, the wolf clan, that quite often that was uh, involved the cultural teachings. So we say we start with our cultural teachings and we begin there. And so our curriculum begins there and then we move to Panther Clan. And so we move all the way through the whole curriculum um, looking at um, what can each of these societies teach us about our health and our wellness and our behaviors. Um, what we're going to do is we do a three month intervention and we end with a vow making ceremony that is the walk on the 10 days, uh, the 10 day walk on the trail. It's out of that vow making that they're going to make a, a, their vow uh, to the community become health leaders. Um, we actually already started naming uh, some of the naming ceremonies for that, and that's been very powerful. We um, had some elders help us with that. And ideally, what we could end up with is, um, in the future, in each of these uh, 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 communities, 30 women. So, for example, if uh, someone says, hey, you know, I, I really am drawn to the teachings of White Crane, and White Crane would have been involved in funerary practices, for example, um, what would, that there was a death, a passing of someone from an overdose in a community, all the White Crane women now would call each other across the, the areas to help each other out, to come and step forward. So what we're doing is we're kind of building in a health societies into our communities in that way. The guiding questions that arose out of that last walk and these are now our next set of guiding questions for our future. What kind of ancestor did my ancestors envision me to be? That's a guiding question for the curriculum. What kind of ancestor do I want to be? And what kind of ancestor do I want or envision future generations to be in my actions now? And the, these are the values that we have in it for inclusion in our curriculum. We had a second walk. We tried it in October because the original trail removal was in October and we got hit with lots of flooding and waters and problems that our ancestors originally had as well. Um, we had to actually move in the middle, in, at, at night time, uh, move camp because of a flash flood, <laughs> imminent danger that we were in. It was quite exciting. Um, but we had some new participants come in and two more mother-daughter pairs. We, uh, we tried a different route. We wanted to uh, look at some new parts of the trail. Fewer bugs, less heat, more rain. Uh, and a tr turkey storyteller uh, met with us, and a traditional storyteller who also talked with us about their... So this is just some of... Uh, yeah, this was during when the parks were closed, national parks. I didn't... I have to say, I did not climb that. <laughs> so the new parts of the trail, uh, we covered some... found some new parts of the trail that are... Um, we're, we hope to get the markers put up eventually for these places. I'm kind of excited about it. It was a little bit colder and rainy the whole time. Um, I want to put a shout out to Little Rock, Arkansas. We actually walked through Little Rock downtown. The trail goes right through downtown Little Rock, Arkansas, right past the University of Arkansas, actually hits part of University of Arkansas. I have to say this is a, one of the funnest places. This is the only place where everyone comes out to greet us, <laughs> where everyone's like, hey, what you all doing? It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, doctoral students got, went with us on this trip this time, uh, Choctaw doctoral students, uh, as well as youth, um, as part of our mentorship activities. Uh, you can see in that photo, um, I only made one moccasin, so yeah, I'm walking with one moccasin and not. My colleague Sandy had finished hers so she could walk with her moccasins on the trail, so I only got one foot in. And I, ma I made a joke some anthropologists might see this in, in uh, 200 years and say, oh, look what they made the mixed blood do. <laughs> so. um, there's our feet. We also um, brought medicines with us. We have a, a woman who works with uh, a massage and stuff and help, help people out who are cramping up on the trail. There's Sandy Stroud and Michelle Johnson Jennings, uh, two of our, our uh, project leaders. 
Um, and K Katie Schultz uh, is a doctoral student who's involved. In the lower corner there is Danica Brown, who helped with conceptualization, part of the curriculum. And just to highlight some of the ceremonies that we did, there was a, a, a full moon ceremony that was held. And one of the stories that was shared, and this is why our original teachings are so important, was, and I'm just going to give you a synopsis of it, I'm not going to tell you the story, but basically, sky, uh, moon, and sun, uh, moon and sun used to share the sky together, sun uh, being a male, moon being a female, and they loved each other very much. Sun tends to have flare-ups, you know, and it flares up with its sun rays, and, and, and it's uh, sun, what do you call those flare-ups? And so um, Moon warned him, those should never touch me, if, I will leave if, if any of those uh, sun flares hit me. And so one day, Sun got really angry and he was just flaring all over and he hit Moon. So Moon, at that point, because it was always day, uh, Moon took her star children and left and went to the other side of the world. And that's how darkness came. So that's one of the stories that we shared and we talked a little bit about original instructions around domestic violence. That was really clear. There is no tolerance, zero tolerance, and you get the kids, <laughs> and you go. <laughs> so, uh, did it work? Um, Carrie, uh, I want to give a head nod to Carrie Herod, who was the head of Behavioral Health at the time. She's now head of um, Air, all I Indian Health Service area, head um, for that area now. You see Carrie in this picture when we started. She had already been training, and she went out and committed to making a vow to her health, to change her health to help the people. And over the course of the year, she dropped, I think, 65, almost 70 pounds, and she's kept it off for almost two years now. So there, that's her now. And that was based on this project. Uh, another person has lost 35 pounds, so uh, for the obesity prevention, the vow making process was very powerful. People talked about it as being truly transformative. Um, we actually shared this, went to New Zealand, took um, a lot of the project folks to New Zealand and shared. So final, I'm just going to wrap up now. Um, things to take away from this. You know, health equity has been defined many ways, but at its core, the concept focuses on promoting social justice rather than the economic or social status as a primary means for determining health. So circling back to the recognition of the relational orientation to the water and our ancestors, you know, that boundary is permeable, it's fluid. It, uh, and if we do not care for it now, we are not caring for the bodies of our future generations. We must truly grow restorative practices, and that's part of the work that we have. Um, and we have to restore our consciousness around some of these uh, elements as well. So, um, in closing, um, one of the things I want to highlight is our diversity is our strength whether it's race, by race, class, sexual orientation, gender expression, we have come a long way in social work and our fight for social justice and health equity. Whether we call it equity or justice, we may share words, create words or embrace words or phrases, but we still and most likely will mean different things for different people. This ambiguous place not only is a site of resistance and resilience, it's a sign of beauty of our diversity. We may share the same political agenda regarding social justice, liberation, and health equity, but have different strategies. We may share the same sky, but have different cosmologies. Our diversity is our strength. Our common fight is our glue, but our liberation, though, is tied to one another. Recognizing all of our diversity, not falling for the homogeneity fallacy that Audre Lorde spoke of. So, you know, to, talk, to fight against oppression, we must look alike, talk alike, and act alike our potential for deep humanity and fighting multiple oppressive structures and creating innovative, innovative research strategies are collaborative and intertwined goals and are intricately connected to this diversity of thought and action. So let's have a giveaway. So upon uh, reflecting on the truth and reconciliation hearings, Desmond Tutu said that it's not human evil or recognition of the immense depth of depravity and suffering that humans impose on one another that most profoundly moved him Rather, it was the fact that human beings could be so good, that human beings could demonstrate such extraordinary magnanimity uh, and nobility of spirit, that human beings can, after excruciating suffering, still be able, in fact, to speak words of healing or forgiveness to one another that so deeply moved him. In the spirit of compassion that our healing journey begins, health equity can be achieved. As social work scholars, I want us to be potent. 
I want us to do good when we can and to hold our wit and collective intelligence like a shield against other people's wantonness and laziness. Above all, I want us to laugh and enjoy ourselves in our research life of our own choosing and in a social work research world of our own making. I want us to be strong and aggressive and tough and resilient and full of feeling. I want us to be everything that's us that is social work, deep at the center of our being. That is my hope for social work research. Yet, quite often, we are seen as a stepchild to other health disciplines. Sometimes they're not even sure what to make of us as social work researchers, particularly in the public health domain. Some say we are at the bottom of the totem pole. So I want to talk about that bottom of the totem pole. Being in the Northwest, I've learned that, besides that being a microaggression, so don't say that, but bottom of the totem pole usually sits frog. Frog is incredibly powerful. Frog is the most powerful in many, in many ways because he has the most power, of tran power for transformation. Frog is incredibly powerful. So we are in a very powerful place to be. Each and every one of us has a responsibility now to recognize that power to address health inequities. A white friend of mine once said, I feel so hopeless. And I said, I can't afford that privilege. If I give up hope, I die. That is a privilege I do not want, nor can we as a collective afford. We are the research leaders we have been waiting for. We are the future of health equity research. We stand on the shoulders of great social work leaders like Dr. Pearson and community elders. And when we lift our collective heart and health in mind, body, spirit, and society, we lift ourselves as we lift the health of the most disadvantaged, oppressed, and ignored. Only when we do this will we truly have a collective impact. Our wellness and health is tied to the health of past and future generations. Dr. King notes, our present work will benefit the healing into the next seven generations and will indeed the lift, lift the health of past generations. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. So I feel it's now our time to stand up and act to improve the health of many nations within our nation, our tribal peoples within our nations here on Turtle Island. Just as micro to macro practice from cell to society Social work interventions have been our body, prevention our mind, but equity is truly our soul. So let's transform. I'd like to end with uh, what Anne Frank said, how wonderful it is that nobody need to wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. So, yo, okay, thank you. <laughs>